Uh, with that, we're going to get into a, a panel discussion on government IT modernization in the era of COVID-19. So I'm really excited to talk to our three speakers. We've got uh, Mike Madsen uh, from the Defense Innovation Unit. He's the Director of Strategic Engagement. And that Keel Krishnan, uh, Vice President of Products, uh, C3AI. And then Kent Cunningham, uh, our CTO and Microsoft Federal Civilian. Um, and uh, so with that, I, I always like to start these panel discussions with everyone telling uh, the, the community a little bit about themselves. So if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're working on specifically around migration and modernization in the federal government. So let's start with Mike. Hey, thank you, Karina. Uh, first off, big thanks to you and a big thanks to Microsoft for putting this on. Uh, this is a very important uh, topic, especially in this strangest of times that we find ourselves now. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, as uh, Karina mentioned, I'm the Director of Strategic Engagement and Operations at the Defense Innovation Unit. Prior to that, I was the Executive Director of the 809 panel charged with streamlining defense acquisition. So it was a pretty smooth transition into uh, DIU from the 809 panel. Uh, both of those organizations concerned with lowering barriers to entry to the defense marketplace. Uh, prior to that, I was in the Air Force. I was a C-17 pilot by training and education. <clears throat> uh, briefly on DIU, so we look to move fast. I mentioned lowering the barriers to entry. Um, and by moving fast, I mean uh, moving at commercial speeds and we look to solve problems across the entire joint force. Ash Carter, uh, then Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter set up DIU in 2015 uh, to leverage the technology in the commercial sector. Uh, our mission has evolved from his initial vision of accelerating commercial technology to include things like bringing in new capabilities and capacity to the department as well as grow the national security innovation base uh, that was called out in the National Defense Strategy. I think uh, most of you are familiar with that. We're headquartered in Silicon Valley. Uh, we have offices in Austin, Boston, and DC. And we're organized around five tech focus areas. Shouldn't surprise anyone out there in this audience. Uh, the five areas are uh, AI, ML, autonomy, human systems, commercial space, and cybersecurity. Uh, these are the areas that we think are undergoing the greatest rate of change in the commercial sector, uh, but we don't rest on those. We're also looking at other, other areas that are evolving, uh, power and energy, advanced uh, technology manufacturing. Uh, and we think that these, these five match the DOD mission set. Uh, and we also think that they are the uh, focus of modernization across the department. Uh, so I'll, I'll uh, stop there and look forward to the discussion this evening. Great, thank, thank you, Mike. I didn't know uh, you were a pilot. That's pretty cool, um, amongst many things. Uh, Nikhil, so if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing in, um, in government and migration and modernization. Uh, sure, um, and uh, echoing Mike's point, thank you um, for having us on. I really appreciate the opportunity. And uh, it's kind of amazing that we're able to do these things, uh, you know, all remotely. Um, uh, you know, just uh, just a few months ago, this would have been unimaginable for at least for us. Um, but I think we're adapting pretty well. Um, so a bit about myself. I've, I've been with C3.ai uh, for the you know better part of a decade, so about nine years. Uh, the company C3 has been around for about 10 years. Um, and, uh, you know, I have uh, prior to C3, so I'm, I'm responsible for all product management, all data science at C3, all, all of our AI and ML activities. Um, before C3, I was uh, um, at McKinsey and Company for a number of years. Uh, before that, I was an assistant professor at Columbia, uh, so kind of an academic by training and background, um, finding myself in the business world. And uh, C3, uh, a bit about C3, we're a product company. We actually are, um, uh, uh, we're Silicon Valley commercial focused product company. We still uh, have most of our business uh, in the commercial space. Um, we're not a defense contractor, um, and we really entered uh, the DOD world and the and the federal world about two and a half years ago through our work with DIU. 
um, but most of the company is still in the in squarely in the commercial space. We're a products-based company, enterprise products company, started by a gentleman by the name of Tom Siebel, who's very famous from uh, his founding of a company known as Siebel Systems. And before that, he was one of the early people who started up um, Oracle Corporation. Um, uh, C3 is actually razor focused on modern modernization, um, and uh, we help the largest enterprises in the world transform themselves using this new step function of technology that's emerging around, you know, distributed cloud computing, uh, this phenomenon of big data, this this increasing sensorization of value chains, and kind of the most important vector of them all, which is uh, AI and machine learning. And so we're squarely in the in the business of helping our customers. Uh, whether DOD, federal, or commercial, modernize on these new technology stacks to really achieve disproportionate operational and business outcomes. Um, and um, uh, and so so that's our everyday. And uh, we're, uh, we're, we have a technology stack that really helps drive modernization on top of platforms like Azure. We're a very big partner with Microsoft, a very strategic partner, and very grateful for that partnership. So with that, let me stop and I'm looking forward to this uh, panel discussion. Um, and um, thank you again for having us. Oh, thank you. Kent? Sure, hi, my name is Kent Cunningham. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for the Federal Civilian Business at Microsoft. I've uh, been here about 14 years. I've worked all across public sector uh, and the private sector uh, before here. Um, so I have responsibility for setting the, the technical strategy uh, within the federal landscape to meet the uh, federal government goals uh, and kind of how we go to market and execute um, to support our customers. Um, you know, for specifically what we're working on around migration and modernization, Karina, I, I think our CEO stated it best earlier today uh, on our earnings call. We've, we've literally seen two years worth of digital transformation uh, and uh, application and, and data networking modernization in just the last two months as we work across the landscape um, to support our customers. This has been everything from uh, remote uh, and teleworking and team working uh, and learning to infrastructure and security models um, across the board, uh, really to, to work alongside our customers to help them adapt and, and stay open and operating uh, as best they can to support their mission. So with that, I kind of want to just set context of how um, how would you define IT modernization, um, and especially in that context of where government is uh, is kind of facing a budget um, and a kind of legacy technology where their budget, you know, over 80% of the budget's allocated to legacy tech. You know, um, how would you define that uh, space of modernization? Uh, me? Um, Didn't know who you're going to. Uh, so, Ken, if you want to kick <laughs> that off. Um, I mean, I think that's kind of tied to what are the top priorities and goals that we see across the IT modernization agendas, um, which I know we're going to talk about in a minute. But I think when we look at modernization, we have to kind of break down the different types of modernization. Um, there's there's application modernization, data modernization, network modernization, uh, and then operational and security modernization. And I think for a lot of our customers, we've seen you know some some paths to this over time as the market matured that created some duplication. Some customers saw um, uh, expenses go in a direction other than what they expected because of the way uh, they deployed. Um, I think some have learned even in the last couple of weeks um, that a full cloud model requires end-to-end -end commitment. Uh, and I think um, you know IT modernization is fully understanding what that mission is that we're trying to deliver, um, what's required from end to end to do that, um, from personnel to uh, processes to the actual technology to back those up and end to end of that technology to be able to achieve modernization. Simply saying that we put something in the cloud and now it runs an IaaS is, is not really um, modernization. That is uh, a path on a, on a long road to modernization uh, that includes an overall operational process to get you there. Nikhil, how would you define IT modernization in kind of a broader context since you have that? Sure. 
<clears throat> yeah, uh, so I, I was going to uh, actually uh, uh, build build upon uh, that uh, because we do see this broader view, and you know, from our vantage point and the, luck, the luxury of kind of where we sit um, and the work that we're able to do in the commercial space, um, you know, we really see it uh, as uh, outcome driven. So it, it is. It is. Uh, so I want to echo what I think Kent was just saying. Uh, but it, but it is it is outcome driven. It's driven by uh, business value, driven by um, uh, by um, uh, by uh, the business side of the transformation or the operational side of the transformation. And on the technology side, it's really a convergence of vectors. So uh, it's not just lift and shift. It's not just data, but it's a convergence convergence of cloud, the data, um, the AI, machine learning, and a next generation of apps. So I really think this ends up being a convergence of technology vectors that are driving a step function change in what enterprise um, information systems are. I mean, no longer is the world going to operate on a relational database based application and a web server driving a business process. If you look to you know, the companies that are on the cutting edge, whether it's Google, Facebook, or you know, even Microsoft, right? Um, you would never drive an Amazon supply chain you know, based on that old school application, you would drive it based on a modern kind of AI enabled app application stack. And I think that's really what we see when we when we see IT modernization. It's not just a lift and shift of data or applications to the cloud. It's really taking advantage of the step function change in, in, in the technologies um, all together in a converged view of data, application stack, processing stack, uh, AI machine learning all coming together to drive better business outcomes. So I think that's that's kind of my view. Happy to uh, go further on that. That's very interesting. Mike, th thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I agree with uh, both of those two. But I'm going to take this a little bit tactical and then bring us back to kind of the strategic view that that they outlined and kind of uh, articulate why modernization has become so important to me. As I mentioned, I was uh, Air Force pilot, and there was. Um, a condition that was so common in this that there was actually a name for it. It's called an exceptional restart. And the C-17 was the most advanced airlift in the world. Computer controlled engines, flight controls, fuel system, the avionics were all digital. It was a glass cockpit. And this exceptional restart I mentioned could happen in any phase of flight, whether you're over the North Atlantic, uh, Asia, Europe, wherever, where the entire cockpit would go completely black. Um, and it's quite uncomfortable being over the North Atlantic when everything goes black. And I tell you that story because in 2000, in the most advanced airlifter, it had the best uh, computer chip technology that 1985 had to offer. Um, and so that, again, is not – that was not a computer chip problem. That is that end-to-end -end problem that Ken talked about um, and that there was a, a problem with the whole modernization stream of that. Um, and it's, it's not just a, a lift and shift, but, but understand the entire uh, process. Uh, I mean, look, in the 1960s, about 30% of global R&D was U.S. Defense Department related. So I'll say that again, one-third of worldwide R&D was U.S. Defense Department related. Now that number is about 3% of global R&D. So in the 60s, during that, that uh, high global R&D spending time, the Department of Defense was the early adopter of technology and could have that end-to-end -end, uh, process that Ken described. Now, commercial technology is evolving at a much faster rate, and we need to make it easier to get that commercial technology uh, to DOD. And for IT modernization, uh, for me, we need to access the commercial technology uh, and the modernization cycles. That's the most important thing is the modernization cycles that the commercial sector has certainly mastered. And then on the flip side of that, we need to make it easier for commercial companies to get access to the DoD market to bring uh, that technology into DoD. So when I think of modernization, um, that's kind of that's kind of the way that I'm thinking about it. In that uh, the long road end-to-end um, -end modernization that Kent described. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think uh, when you say long road, how long are we talking about? <laughs> Um, where do people start in, in, in defining where to make impact and modernization? Well, I think you have to look at, at the system holistically um, and at a certain point start uh, chipping away at it. The last thing we want are these uh, Frankenstein solutions where 
we just uh, bolt on modernization pieces. And, and I think we can't talk about modernization without also talking about uh, culture and workforce, which is related to that long game that you mentioned, Karina. We, I, I talked about prototyping uh, technology, but it's also important to be prototyping methodologies and that shift of looking at things from a, a holistic perspective. Uh, and I think it was John in the last section, I think it was John that was talking about, um, uh, he briefly described um, the benefit of partnering early with uh, what sounded like customers because of this modernization is a change and, and sometimes change is, is difficult to incorporate into a, a workforce and culture. Yeah. How, uh, so we're, we're talking about, you know, impact to people and we, we've all experienced uh, I don't think there's anyone um, around the planet who hasn't experienced or been impacted by COVID-19. Um, how has that this uh, pandemic really impacted the, the IT modernization agenda in the federal government? Uh, Kent, have you seen um, changes across um, that kind of plane? Absolutely. I don't think I've seen anything that hasn't changed, um, Karina. And, you know, it's interesting. I think the pandemic has to some extent reiterated the end-to-end -end model of, of modernization that we've outlined uh, in our discussions so far. Um, to take kind of an interesting look at it, uh, at another note, there was something humorous uh, last week where the Walmart CEO was on the Today Show and outlined buying trends during this time that they've seen in Walmart and how buying trends evolved from paper goods to puzzles and entertainment and then to grooming goods as people stay at home longer and longer. And we've seen a, a similar uh, evolution in technology as we've gone through this COVID-19 period. You know, major areas of focus have obviously been initially in the areas of uh, enabling telework and remote access to, to business applications across government. This of course included audio and video conferencing uh, of, of complete unprecedented amounts. Uh, with expansion across teams, uh, which included provisioning, uh, which has been uh, in the press a few times, uh, over 4 million DOD accounts into a team's environment in a very short period of time uh, to support their needs as, as folks need to work from home. Uh, we then saw an evolution once people could be productive, we saw folks with a big push for things like BDI support to be able to gain access to on-premises applications. And this included, of course, Microsoft Virtual Desktop, as well as third-party platforms such as Citrix on Azure expansions uh, across a variety of customers. Uh, Azure AD application proxy became an overnight hero so that agencies could enable remote access to on-premises web applications through their existing Azure subscriptions. And of course, we saw a number of customers with immediate needs for, for improved scalability and expansion of their enterprise applications uh, that were subsequently either augmented with serverless processes and power app developments to enable that workflow, or, or many were even migrated to the Azure cloud for access to improved scale, compute, and storage as they were forced to work from home. Um, so we saw this, this evolve, and, and as additional workloads and collaborations moved to the cloud, um, that placed a huge emphasis on additional automation, networking, and security. So we'll talk about those three just kind of real quickly. I mean, from an automation perspective, we saw things like uh, the Microsoft Bot Service with a variety of agencies and healthcare environments, including the CEC Self Checker bot on their website, which I think a lot of people have seen. That same bot was leveraged to automate help desk inquiries for agencies. Uh, and, and states and a variety of universities who need to get information out quickly without completely overwhelming call centers and email systems. And all of this led to overwhelming uh, networks, VPN devices, identity platforms, um, security uh, entities, that which, which then had to be evaluated. So uh, we saw a huge focus on networking and VPN environments as, as many agencies were not in a position to support 100% telework. They were provisioned for 20, 30, 40, or 50% telework. Um, so they're, uh, they were designed with for compliance with existing VPN and TIC 2.0 models. So they had to quickly move to a secure internet model uh, instead of that. And that was based um, uh, you know, for, for a variety of cloud services, they had to go Internet Connect instead of their legacy tic models. And this was really supported by the updated guidance from CISA, which was largely based on TIC 3.0, that enabled agencies to offload traffic from their core networks by largely 
leveraging cloud native security functions that are available like Defender ATP for prevent prevention detection and response of, of advanced threats or conditional access uh, policies in a zero trust model uh, to, uh, to authenticate uh, transactions based on identity location, device health, and so forth. And so it's kind of a long-winded way to say across the board, we've seen tremendous innovation and everyone pulling together to their very best to support one another. But it has been a, a focus, a, a very bright light focus on that digital transformation, modernization requires an end-to-end -end thought. And we've literally seen that end-to-end -end play out week over week uh, as, as customers needed to go fully digital. Great. So if I took your analogy of we're now in the grooming stage of, of <laughs> impact of COVID, Nikhil, what, what would you say is beyond grooming in the Walmart example here? Uh, what, what do you think we'll see um, in kind of that evolution moving forward? Yeah, no, I, was, I was kind of reflecting on that as Kent was talking. And I, I, I had a, um, you know, it actually is related a bit to your previous comment, uh, Karina, on the long road uh, to modernization. I think we actually don't have a long road uh, left anymore. So if you look at, you know, if, uh, if you look at the, um, you know, where are, where from a DOD standpoint, where near peers are, you know, where China might be or where Russia is in terms of um, their, um, their capability set and their investments and the investments that they are making and where, and we see other countries, you know, and other um, in other situations responding to COVID, uh, for example, in ways that, you know, are in some ways are more agile than we can, right, um, here in the United States. And that to me just highlights the imperative that, you know, we actually do not have a long road uh, anymore. We actually have to move and move fast and move right now in terms of modernizing our systems and our, our technology sets. And uh, you know we've seen uh, uh, from from our commercial vantage point, uh, we've kind of seen one of the things that we one of the pieces of software that uh, we're known for in the commercial space is you know AI based technologies for um, managing supply chains. And just in the last three weeks, the amount of interest that we fielded in that space has been tremendous. Where companies of all sorts are reaching out to us and trying to AI enable their supply chains because they're scrambling to figure out, hey, what's the next thing that people are going to want? And let's try to figure out, uh, you know, if, if you're a Walmart, you know, what comes after grooming products or how do I make sure that my suppliers are actually going to deliver on time or which of my suppliers are actually not going to deliver on time and how do I plan accordingly? Um, you know, are my workers going to show up? You know, if so, uh, how many, where? Uh, and uh, that's just one example of um, of where we see you know it going over the longer term is more of more of these analytic applications that actually uh, drive uh, drive significant significant value that involve crunching of uh, all of the data that a company might have access to from the enterprise as well as from the extra extra prize applying these techniques and so that the value of these. Uh, machine learning techniques and next generation applications and modernization technologies, I think, only increases um, and we have to get it right sooner rather than later. That's kind of my my point. No, I think we can all feel that. I think I saw an article that, I don't know, the president um, just deemed, um, I think, uh, poultry and you know, um, factories is essential because of that supply chain kind of crunch that we were feeling on just getting that in our grocery stores. Um, so I think, you know, it becomes a very personal story of uh, that agility and our ability to respond and uh, it impacts each of us individually. Mike, what yes, do you uh, think? Karina, just to, just to make yes, that, uh, uh, just to uh, uh, highlight that, right? You. Companies don't have the luxury of now searching across 15 different SAP systems or Oracle databases to figure out where that stuff is that they actually need to ship. They need to know immediately, hey, it's in this factory or it's left this factory or it's in transit and going XYZ location um, and uh, or, or, you know, it's censored on an IoT device. And so they just don't have the weeks or months to analyze the stuff anymore. They just need to know in real time. I mean, I think we could even uh, flip to the the urgency for ventilators and the ability for even companies to pivot quickly. Um, and we're seeing this all in real time. Mike, I mean, uh, to the DOD, wow. I mean, going from 
thirty percent R and D in uh, spent in the uh, in DoD to three percent today. Do you see that changing, or you know, how's the DoD going to respond now uh, more than ever? It was top of the agenda to modernize uh, before COVID nineteen. How how is this going to put even more pressure, if if any, um, for the DoD um, to become even more nimble? Uh, yeah, I think um, it's going to, um, I don't know, if putting pressure or shifting the axis of the pressure. I think through the lens of history, this tragic time is going to be viewed as the inflection point that it truly is. Um, Nikhil uh, kind of laid out uh, some things that I think are absolutely true, um, you know, where we had time before there's a, a new sense of urgency, and that is going to become the new normal in a lot of ways. And applying that to the department, uh, one thing is we can't cut R&D for sure, um, but I think we will have to continue to find ways to maximize uh, the dollars that are out there. Um, you know, what we haven't even talked about is the, the changing fiscal environment. How How is this response going to impact, you know, budgets 5, 10, 15 years from now? There certainly will be some impact. What it's going to be, who knows? Uh, but certainly we need to find ways to ensure that we are getting the most value for that dollar. And for us, again, that's leveraging the commercial technology, that that increasing uh, the cycles, the agility um, that you described is uh, leveraging that and, and bringing in that knowledge, that research and development into the department is gonna be increasingly important going forward, especially uh, coming out of this crisis time that we're in now. Yeah, so we're we're almost at the top of the hour, and as I'm thinking, you know, as we're listening to you, and this has been a, a fascinating discussion. You know, the impact of COVID is definitely very personal to every one of us, and I think we feel. I mean, I can speak to myself, compelled to contribute. Uh, you know, each of us to the solution um, to kind of solve all our collective pain. Um, what would be a piece of advice you would share with everyone um, listening tonight on how they could contribute um, to this uh, call for modernization or that pivot you were saying of, of, of where um, they should focus to um, make impact? So Mike, maybe start with you. Okay. Great. Um, well, first, modernization of the department, uh, from my perspective, is going to take all players, the traditional vendors, non-traditional vendors, prime, systems integrators, small business, et cetera. It's going to take everyone. Everyone has a, a role to play in that. And as we just talked about, the government R&D is decreasing dramatically. The fiscal environment is unknown, but certainly changed going forward. So it is absolutely imperative uh, to ensure that government and industry have a better understanding of ways to work together. For us in DIU, um, that means uh, working to help DOD a more sophisticated partner for industry um, to rapidly award prototype contracts in 60 to 90 days instead of two years um, and understanding the business cycles of the commercial sector. I think for commercial companies, it's understanding the way that DOD works, uh, the budgeting cycle, uh, and those kind of things. And while we don't necessarily need the culture of Silicon Valley to be like the culture of the Department of Defense, certainly not that. Um, and it's probably not a, not useful either for DOD to fully adopt the culture of Silicon Valley. It's important to understand each side and find those ways to um, sand down the friction points and dovetail more closely so that we can leverage that R&D spending that's taking place. Amazing, Nikhil, any thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I probably know the least uh, here on, on the uh, in terms of the DOD, but from just outside in, right, from our, our observation point, um, I think uh, what DIU has done has been absolutely uh, outstanding. You know, we would have, as a vendor, never have been able to serve um, the federal government had it not been for uh, for DIU because there's just no way we're going to be able to respond. We don't. We won't have the budgets and the times and the cycles to respond to, you know, multi-year RFP effort that involves, you know, hundreds of pages and five million dollars of investment. There's just no way we can even play in that space. Um, and then if you think through the technology vectors and the speed of modernization, 
it's not a once and done. I mean, this this technology stack, this this uh, these technologies are actually evolving and evolving, you know, at a ever ever faster paces. So my view on it, in terms of COVID and what folks can do, if, if there are folks here on the line who are listening and who are involved in procurement decisions, requirement decisions, I would beg people to not write multi-year RFP requirements, but figure out some happy pathway where uh, where we can prove concepts demonstrate technology benefits and then move them from prototype into production you know on more rapid time scales in more and th that doesn't mean by the way embracing silicon valley all the way but like there's an in-between point that i think makes more sense where we can get to be uh, more agile uh, and um, and more nimble at deploying these technologies at a lower cost and price point um, and actually more responsive to the needs of the warfighter and the needs of the dod um, than uh, than current cycles. I think that would probably be the number one ask I would have of everyone. Wow, that's right. Kent? Kent? Sure, I guess just to summarize, um, you know, mission critical modernization, which we've discussed for a while here today, does require that end-to-end -end commitment, which is identity, yeah. security, compliance, scalable compute and storage solutions, uh, network scalability. We, we even saw a lot of limitations with device availability in, in recent weeks. And at Microsoft, we're really fortunate to have one of the largest cloud infrastructures in the world with you know thousands of security professionals, hundreds of millions of cores, vast development team, that type of thing. But what what we need to do and what we want to do is, is make sure that we can partner with customers on their business needs. What is it that they need to do to support their mission? I think in the past, a lot of agencies, companies, entities, organizations looked at their technology partners and they only brought them in when they had clear technology problems that they were trying to overcome instead of engaging them as business partners that could actually help them drive those outcomes. Those of us that are the technical leaders in this field need to be asking our customers business questions. What are your goals? What are your perceived obstacles for reaching these goals? What does success look like to you? Who are your stakeholders? And we have this discussion. We remove the need for the customers to be super technical and the lines of business owners to fully understand our platform so they can focus on their needed hand. Um, then we can work together on the technical architectures. How are we gonna, gonna do data migration, ingestion, governance, and those types of things, set policies to, to support the agency requirements in a manner that uh, supports them and the compliance and security team. So I would just say, you know, I think what we can do is learn to speak other, each other's language a little bit. And as we speak with customers more about the business outcomes that they need to achieve, we're all ultimately more successful. Um, because um, we can help them bring the right solutions to bear. Thank you, Kent. Um, no, this. Uh, thank you for all the speakers tonight. Uh, this has been a fascinating talk. Uh, my next dinner party, all three of you have to come over because it would be an amazing conversation. But uh, in all seriousness, uh, thank you for the, the dialogue. It ha gives us all a lot of food for thought as we kind of move forward. Um, so we really appreciate it. I, as far as um, I apologize for the participants because I didn't leave a lot of time for questions. So we'll um, we'll have to table them for this meetup. Uh, but uh, for uh, just a reminder for everybody, uh, we do have our next meetup. Um, I think it was May 27th, so I hope you join us. And thank you everybody for making this such a successful um, meetup. Um, and hopefully everyone uh, stays safe. Um, so with that, I will say uh, good night. <laughs>